Welcome to Industrial Marketing Live. I'm Peyton Warren. I am a strategist here at the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla 76. And I'm one of your IML hosts today. Um, Want to say just a big thank you to everyone who is joining us live today. Um, love just hitting that admit all button and seeing you guys all flow in. Um, and we're really excited to hear what y'all think about our topic today, which is storytelling. We all have a good story and what makes a good story can be defined in a lot of different ways. Um, is it something that's relevant? Is it exciting, suspenseful, surprising, inspiring, sometimes maybe even like scary? Is it just something that draws our attention, right? Um, but the question is like, where does storytelling fit in the world of industrial marketing? And I mean, I think there's a few obvious answers, uh, case studies, ad campaign plans, content creation, like videos, blogs, social media posts, uh, just to name a few. But today uh, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper about how like that story arc can really imp impact your marketing efforts and how folks interpret what you do and um, what you sell. So we are welcoming Gorilla 76 writer and novelist, Grace Halverson, to the IML stage to discuss how to transform this idea of storytelling into an effective go-to marketing tool. So with that, I want Grace to just say a little bit, say hello, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Grace. As Peyton said, I am a writer here at Gorilla 76. I have also written two novels. Neither of them are published yet, but I am I'm working on that. It's quite a quite a long, lengthy process here. Um, I graduated from the University of Missouri School of Journalism in 2020, and now I live in Washington, DC. I am a big reader and a big writer, and I always have been both. Um, so if there's one thing I love, it is story. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, so I think what one of the first questions we have here is, you know, why is it so important for manufacturers to tell a story in their marketing? And like, you know, overall, like what what's the connection between story and marketing? I am so glad that you asked. Story <laughs> is important for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it's an excellent tool for understanding your customers. When you understand them as real people with problems and wants and needs, it's easier to create compelling messaging that resonates with them. Because if you do your research right and tell the right story, there's a good chance your customers will go, huh, that sounds a lot like what I'm going through. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's important for understanding your customers and creating messaging that resonates. Awesome. So messaging that resonates great, um, you know, like, I guess, like without story, one of the things that we've really talked about, Brendan, you know, and like, maybe we've seen this and um, come to fruition sometimes. And Aaron, I think you even mentioned experiencing this yourself as well. You know, so if you don't have a story, what is the default for manufacturers or? They all write biographies about themselves and they're so bull boring and dull. <laughs> they're terrible. You know, it's all, all like you go to so many marketing or manufacturing websites and I know you all have probably seen this, but it's a lot of like us and we and my, and you know, this company, um, and not a word about their customers anywhere on their homepage or any other important web, uh, web page on their site. And uh, it just doesn't connect with anybody. Um, you know, you have to be a really big history nerd to really connect with a, with a biography about somebody. Um, but what really connects with people is a story about them, right? So when you shift the narrative and the focus of who you're writing the story about and you're writing your story about your customers as your hero, that's, that's powerful. And that changes how the customers relate to you. Um, and the, you start to create a relationship there instead of just constantly talking about yourself. So you know, if, if you, if your website has a lot of, you know, us and I and our language, you might need to really pay attention to this, this uh, episode here and figure out how to kind of reframe your narrative. Yeah. And, and, you know, and one thing that we're not talking about today is like, we're not talking about the buyer persona. Like, yeah, we want to reframe the narrative around our customer, but it's not about just like, this is marketer Mike or engineer Eric, um, we're talking more about 
the themes and the emotion that we want to drive through story. Um, but that persona is a component of this, right? That persona is a main character in the story, but it's, it's not, it's not the whole thing. Like there's a whole other, like, you know, the, the like I put in the, the chat, the Hobbit's my favorite story, but it's not just a story about Bilbo, right? It's a story about the things that Bilbo's going through. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a component of this, but it's not, it's not the whole thing. So I'm excited to have Grace kind of share with us, like what are those main, the beats of the story and like the, those important aspects of a story for us to latch onto and, and use inside of our industrial marketing. For sure. Yeah. And so I think the, the first place we wanted to take this today is, so Brett had already mentioned, like, you know, reframing it, you are not um, the the hero of the story your customers the hero of the story so let's talk about the concept of like character development right like grace you mentioned you want to make sure that you're understanding your customers um so like to de can you just talk us through like the concept of character development like if we are not the hero of the story who is and um like what are the different roles that we really need to be filling out here yeah, sure, I can talk about that. So the most important element of a story is the main character, because an audience will follow a relatable, well fleshed out character through a terrible plot, but they will not follow a terrible character through an incredible plot. A plot. It's just, that's just not how that works. People care about characters. And when you do it right, they care about characters a lot. Um, so yeah, as, as we've said that uh, your customer is the main character of the story, it's not you. And when you go about developing characters, especially for a novel, but also for marketing, there are some important questions you kind of need to ask. And it's, what does my character want? What are their goals? What does success look like? And what's stopping them from getting that? Um, and that's, that's the big thing there. It's all about motivation. If you can figure out the why for behind your characters and your customers' decision-making, what motivates them to make a decision, make a change, you're golden. When I'm writing a brand narrative for uh, for one of my clients, I tend to run, run across a few kind of similar whys. Um, a lot of people, the big feelings that motivate them to make a change with what they're doing is, is frustration. Something's not working. It's really, really annoying and they can't figure out how to make it better. And so it just eats away at them until they make a change. Or similarly, pride. A lot of our customers, our, our clients' customers are really proud of the work they do. And if it goes wrong and something's not working and it stops them from doing their job well, that's that really doesn't sit well with them. So if you can find the big feelings for why your customers think the way they do and you can speak to those, you're on the right track. Okay, so your customer is the hero. Luke Skywalker, if you will. I was not going to get through this without talking about Star Wars. So where, where does that leave you? You are the guide, guiding them to success, which is your product or your service. You are Obi-Wan Kenobi, you are Yoda, you have the answers. So kind of along that vein, you go, hey, Luke Skywalker, I heard you're really frustrated that you can't use the force. Well, happen to use the force I do, train people like you I do. Here's how I can help you achieve your goals. So that's, that's what it kind of looks like in a brand narrative too. When you're telling your customer's story, that's, that's the positioning, that's how you should put yourself into the story. So when your customer or your hero is doing research online or they're scrolling through LinkedIn and they find you and your ads and your website, they go, huh, okay, yeah, you can solve my problems. That sounds great. So we have a hero and you have the guide, but we're missing one big thing. And that would be the villain. Yeah, the big yes, bad evil guy. The villain. Exactly. Every good story has an antagonist foiling the protagonist's plan at every move. Um, and that's true in marketing, but your antagonist hopefully will not be a person in, in marketing. Um, your antagonists are those big pain points that your customers are facing. Like, for example, something like high scrap rate or a lack of internal expertise or a risk of a dangerous equipment failure, any other number of problems that your customers might have. That is what you are fighting against. I'll say, so just put a little pin in here. Um, one thing that we've been having success with one client that I've, I've been working with is um, a, a hidden supply chain issue. A lot of their customers don't understand, like there's a really big supply chain issue out there for some specific components. And, you know, they start reaching out for quotes and it, they like eyes wide open because they're like, holy crap, I didn't know it was, you know, a year out to get a little fan because of the chip issue that we're having. Um, and so, yeah, they, like a lot of the story that we're telling this year is all about, you know, trying to overcome this, this hidden supply chain problem that's out there. 
Um, and we got that insight because we talked to the customers and we asked them, what are your pain points and what are the things that you're dealing with? And we had some proprietary data from internal software uh, that we were able to extrapolate and, and kind of build out the story from. Yeah. So I think, yeah, for our purposes, Grace, it does sound like, you know, it's more of like a force, uh, like a bad, a bad thing that's happening out there instead of like a single person, but it's still like that, you know, ominous dark cloud over the story. For sure. Could not agree more with that. All right. So great. So we have the main character, we have the hero, mm -hmm. we have the guide or the mentor, and then we have big, bad, evil guy, dark, ominous cloud thing. So what else like, so, but that's not a story, right? So what else do we need? Great question, Brendan. So you have your characters. What now? So what are the good plot elements of a story that you need to include? There's a reason that I mentioned Star Wars earlier, and it's because A New Hope follows one of the oldest, most classic storytelling formats around, the hero's journey. So you have your hero who's living their everyday life, something's missing, and they receive a call to action and meet a mentor who helps them along the way. They fight the big bad and they return home different than before. Um, so yeah, that, that is a story that, that's, that's the format we use with almost all of our brand narratives. Um, and crucially, to make that work, you need conflict. This is your customer and their problems. If your customer doesn't want a high scrap rate and your problem is a high scrap rate, congrats, you've got conflict. Uh, but you just need to remember to consider how this conflict makes your customer feel and how that impacts them on a daily basis. So that's that's key there because it's got to be a big enough conflict that like, something has to change. Something's got to give here. Yeah, and so I think so, you made an important point there, Grace. I think you have to define what the stakes of this thing are, right? If you don't overcome the scrap rate, what bad thing is going to happen to you, right? Like there has to be some like really intense stakes here, right? Like if if Luke doesn't destroy the Death Star, uh, the entire galaxy falls into the hands of the Empire. Um, you know, like that's some big stakes. Um, and you know, it might be like personal stakes too. Like you know, if you don't do this, you might lose your job, or if you don't do this, like you won't reach your revenue goals for this year, or you know, you might lose these important customers. Right? So, like, what are the stakes of of the conflict? Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say next. We need drama. We need consequences, and we need stakes. What happens yeah, if your hero fails? <laughs> There could be fines, their job could be on the line. Somebody could actually get hurt. Sometimes that, that happens when you use the wrong wrong supplier, the wrong product. There, there has to be like actual consequences to, to their actions here. And finally, the other important thing that we need to make sure we include is a resolution. You have successfully guided the customer to your solution. What happens next? How is life different for your customer? How is it easier? How is it better? Is it more efficient in what tangible specific ways has their job improved thanks to your product or your service and that's your resolution yeah and you you just said this like what tangible specific ways has their life changed and i think this is um one of um uh, it's a trap that you can easily fall into when you're writing this story is just to be very generalized right and maybe not get into these hyper specific examples but that is what makes this story arc that you're writing resonate when it is truly speaking to the experiences that your customers are having and they can put themselves into the shoes of your ad copy, right? Like you're writing your ad copy to them, unpacking a little bit of this one, one element of this plot um in this ad copy and they see themselves there and they're like oh my gosh they get me and that's what's gonna end up you know grabbing their attention and encouraging them to click see more read more of that ad copy or learn more click through that ad copy and get to your website where you can unpack even more of the story um so like we've talked about a lot of different plot elements and like it's there's a lot there, but you are not having to tell every single, like you're not telling the whole story in every piece of content that you create. Hey puppy, um, <laughs> Blair's little puppy. Um, so yeah, you, you, you want to make sure that you're just keeping story in context, um, with these specific examples that you're able to provide to add the color along the way. So before we move on from that, one of the favorite 
uh, like tangible specific ways a job has improved that I've heard from customers is this was for a product that allowed somebody to do something remotely as opposed to having to go and physically check it. Um, we had somebody say that this allowed them to cut their days on the road from 12 a month to three or four a month, which is just a very specific tangible thing that people can relate to because like oh this person now has time to be home with their family they can go hang out with their grandkids they can go do all of these things that they might not have been able to before because they were traveling so much but now because of this product they don't actually have to go physically check this thing at a facility they can just stay from their home office hey Peyton we had a question from Salim I'd like to bring him on uh <clears throat> to start opening up some questions. So Salim, if you uh, would like to, could you uh, unmute and, and come on stage and ask your question? Sure. Hello. Um, my question is, uh, what is the best way to push back against internal stakeholders that are reviewing a go-to-market narrative that was developed specifically using uh, customer interviews? And most of the push, most of the pushback is generally around the drama that is true for the customers, but we don't want to touch on in our marketing? That's a great question, because that is walking a fine line. I think it is important in that case to show stakeholders some of the actual interviews and the direct quotes in that situation um, to show that this is something that people care about. There is a pattern of this. And then probably working with those stakeholders to find, find a happy medium for what how you can address that fear without necessarily over dramatizing it or getting into something that makes people uncomfortable in your team. I would just add there that to Grace's point, sometimes just showing them like proof is in the pudding, like your customer actually said this um, can make all the difference and then just dissolve that fear and get buy-in. Um, but sometimes the, the pushback then I get from from that is, well, that was one customer. So that's why it's so important to interview more than one customer when you're generating these go-to-market narratives, because you want to, as, as Grace said, like you want to identify the trends because this is something, this go-to-market narrative is not just um, something that the marketing team can use, but it's a much broader tool that can be applied to sales conversations, training new team members on how like your customers interact with your company and why they want to interact with your company. So you want to be tying back to trends. And then that's just going to, when you have multiple customers saying that this pain point or this conflict, this problem it exists for them, you've got even more um, ammunition to like make your case for stakeholders too. But I can also see something where you're going to, you're still going to get pushed back. Right. And <clears throat> I think, you know, once you like, you try to make your case and you still keep getting pushed back, you know, I think, you know, option B would be to still use the details from the interviews, but maybe make them less specific, right. To, you know, if, if there's like a, a sensitive process or relationship you're trying to protect, um, you know, maybe you can make that the stakes maybe a little more generic or a little less specific, um, to kind of get at what you're trying to say without being as direct. Um, and that, you know, and it's more just to appease leadership so that you can deploy a narrative. Um, you know, the worst case scenario is that you don't deploy any narrative and you just fall back on no story. But if you can at least get some story out there and start proving out that what you're talking about works, um, and once you get some reps, you know, maybe then you can start, you know, adding in more specific details once you start deploying that story into your marketing. Um, so I, I think it's always like having some stories better than no story. And so whatever you have to do to like, you know, reduce the detail or the specificity just to get something out there, I think it's more important than not having it and like really fighting for, you know, I want to get this one point out there. <clears throat> and, and, uh, Zach made a really cool, um, point in the chat, Zach Nelson, um, you, you're just straight to the point, don't overstate the stakes. Um, and I, I guess I was just uh, curious, you know, if you had any other color that you'd like to add, Zach, to to that conversation um, that we're having here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, sure. No, I um, just I've seen it a lot in my career, just as a marketing manager uh, and brand manager, is uh, marketing messaging that overstates 
what the stakes are because that often backfires you know if you try to say that the world depends on this message you know or that your business depends on this message um backfires because a your stakeholders get <clears throat> uh cold feet but also you know uh so so do the client you know yeah. um you know i and i i think part of the message um that um you know grace is telling and, and that that story brand is about and that storytelling and narrative is about that is that goes hand in hand with um uh with risk management that we're all kind of to some degree in the business of risk management and so we need to just sort of understand um our clients and our own bosses tolerance for risk you know just as we do with you know investments or whatever and if you just do a kind of just quick mental sliding scale of like okay they're you know able to tolerate you know 50 percent risk and and you know tried and true or whatever then you can kind of apply that to your narrative and how much risk you're able to take without getting into too much trouble and i think i don't remember whether it was um uh, brendan or who was mentioning about kind of softening the yeah. narrative um in order to, i think that's what he you know what i'm getting at is what brendan was getting at you know is you can kind of tone down turn the volume up or down on yeah. the narrative based on that internal assessment of risk management. Yeah, that's, that's right on. Uh, I would like to add some some more context on my experience. And I've been through uh, three companies that uh, they didn't make widgets. They're mostly solution providers and like engineering focused. And all three have uh, have had success, a long term success by telling themselves we know better than the customer. Mm -hmm. And through through their product development uh, cycles, and a lot of the leaders uh, take that mindset and and uh, use it all over the business. That's 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 why I've sure. I've always had the no. We know better. We don't want to ask customers. No, you shouldn't talk to customers. The sales should talk to customers, etc. So like that's the background of of my personal struggles in the past with this one, this case specifically. Yeah, oh, that's I, that might be a different issue than Salim. Like, if there's like a lot of philosophical pushback, that might not be something that uh, can be overcome, which is unfortunate. Um, and you know, I think if they're having success being very blunt like that, maybe you don't got to change anything. But we've had we've seen a lot of really good marketing success implementing stories like this, um, and it's a shame if they uh, if they don't want to uh, to implement something like this. But you can't change everyone's mind, I guess. Awesome. Um, so I think we've talked about a lot of different things here, you know, um, but the biggest point is that a go to market narrative, a story is a foundational element to any go to market strategy. And it's something that you want to use as um, a North star in a way when you are creating anything for your marketing company, any messaging or from, for your, for your company, any marketing for your company. Um, so my next question is just kind of to unpack that a little bit more, like, great. We have this go-to-market narrative. We have a story. We've decided, we've decided on who the hero is, who the guide is, um, you know, what the stakes are, what problems are having. We've identified all of these things. Great. Now what, now what do I do with this information and how do I apply it? Um, to actually take advantage of it in your marketing. So I, I'd like to hand that to, to Grace uh, first, if if you would jump in there. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure the content team uses it in slightly, slightly different ways than you guys do in the strategy department. So I'll talk um, how the content team at Gorilla uses these kind of brand narratives. So it's super helpful to have these because they show the entire buyer's journey from the buyer's perspective. So you can figure out what kind of gaps you have in your current content that apply to each specific stage in the journey, which is really helpful when you're trying to like, oh, do we have enough about like a problem and resolution or like uh, how we actually fit into this? Or do we need more thought leadership about this specific part of this journey? So that's an option too. 
Um, we use it a lot in ad copy. Our lovely conversion writer, Alan, has said he lifts sections directly from it sometimes and puts it into ad copy because it's so, if you do it right, concisely talks about your customer's issues in a way that is should resonate with them. Um, we also get CTAs from there, um, what you want the customer to do. You can find that in the in in the journey it's that's where the mentor calls the hero to action like hey this is this is what you can do this could help you and that is super helpful to use in paid social and emails and landing pages and so much more um it was also these the brand narratives that we had for customers that i inherited or clients i inherited when i joined gorilla last fall um it was really helpful to be able to read through read through the narrative and get a good summary of what this client does and who they work with and how they help them. Super, super helpful. That's how I use it in, in content. I'd say it's pretty similar to how we would use it on the strategy side. Uh, you know, it kind of it guides, you know, the types of campaigns that we want to run. Like if there's a really compelling piece of the narrative, like maybe it makes sense for us to do something that's like, a, you know, I don't, what do we call it? Um, old game, new game kind of thing, right? Like there's like, there's a specific like change in the story there from like the old way to the new way. Um, you know, I like to run what I call like brand ads that are really like, here's the problem. Uh, here's the solution that the mentor provides. And then here's the resolution the main character can get. Um, and we, that's a, what a lot of my ad copy is in, you know, running the cold ads to our larger audience. Um, so yeah, I open it up pretty frequently when I'm you know, brainstorming and coming up with campaigns and creating ad briefs uh, to hand off uh, to the creative team. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's always opened. Um, it's, it's super valuable and it's got, you know, the way that we write it, we put the insights right in there, right? We, we have quotes. Um, so just, yeah, it just really helps you like get into the mindset of the customer and like what messaging do you, we think is going to resonate with the customer based on the story that we're trying to tell. And Jonas had a question in the chat, um, you know, like how, how long and detailed should this narrative be? You know, like what's, what's your best practice, Grace? What, what do you suggest there? Generally, I mean, I'm going to say it should be as long as detailed as you need. But as the novelist. <laughs> right. This, this story takes as long as the story takes. That's just, that's just how that works. Um, but generally all of ours end up being around three ish pages with formatting about 1200 words. It, probably shouldn't be too much longer than that or else it's just going to be too much to digest. Um, you want it to be interesting and readable, but there's there's a fine line between, oh my God, this is way too much. And I feel like we're missing something here. So 1200 words ish is roughly what I do. Um, and details, the more details you can get in there though, the better. Because like if you can like swap out your company name with another one and it still makes sense, then that's yeah. that's not detailed enough. But I think you like that is a place that you can end up with. We have very talented writers that can like build out a story from interviews. But Jonas, I think, you know, to get started, you know, as a marketer myself, I'm not a writer. You can just go in there and just start putting bullet points in and build this thing as you learn. Right. So bullet point, who is the main character? You know, it's operations managers at machining companies. Boom. There you go. All right. Who's the guide? My company with this solution. What is the, the thing that we have? Well, we have this, you know, this whatever, you know, the specific tool for the machinists. Um, who's big, bad, evil guy, you know, labor problems, maybe. Um, and so like, just start putting bullet points in there and then you can keep fleshing it out as you learn more about your audience as you, like, keep like, yeah, it's not just you write this thing and then you're done writing it. It's let's just, you know, incrementally build it. That's how I would recommend doing it um, for you all out there is just incrementally build these things as you learn about your customers, as you do interviews, uh, as you sit in on sales calls, uh, you know, as you're diving into the CRM, as you're in platform, looking at what messaging resonates just keep updating this thing as you, as you learn. So don't feel like you have to go out and just like stare at a blank screen and write a 1200 word document with, with nothing, just, you know, maybe write a 400 word document or, you know, like a four paragraph thing and just get something out there so you can keep editing from there. And yes, there this, are, this should be a living, breathing document that changes as you learn more about your customers and as your product offerings change slightly. Yeah. With every customer interview, I think it's worth revisiting it. Um, but yeah, just to Brendan's point about the bullets, like, I think it's really simple. Like the hero's journey is, um, we, we were talking about this in the prep call. We're like, there's a lot of different ways to tell a story. Why is it the hero's journey that we all like latch onto? And it's because it's so simple, right? Um, it's something that it's easy to follow. Um, and you don't want to introduce like 
complexity. Like we were talking about, well, there's three act Shakespeare plays. Like we don't need to do that in <laughs> our, um, you know, manufacturing marketing. The hero's journey is like good enough um, to do that. So just looking at each element of the plot, putting a heading of like that journey. And then like Brendan said, just jot down the notes that you have. Um, note like this customer has shared this problem. Uh, and then, you know, maybe down the road, it becomes more of a narrative um, paragraph sort of situation, but bullets will get you there just as well. Moby, how about you hop in here and ask your question? I think that's super relevant to what we're talking about right now. Yeah, I'm going to base that of uh, Mary Kay's comment, and I'm going to ask her to jump on too. But if you're a one person or a very small marketing team, how do you start that process of building a narrative? Yeah, so selfishly, like um, I interviewed the company I was entering just as much as they were interviewing me. So I made sure that they were open to doing a narrative workshop because they, I knew they didn't have one. They didn't have like a go-to-market strategy. They didn't have a go-to-market narrative. So I was like, guys, I'm going to make you sit in a room for 90 minutes and we're going to hash this out. And if I don't like it, then we're going to sit in the room for another 90 minutes until we get it right. And you guys are happy that this is something you can own in your sales narrative, in how you're prioritizing product updates, because we're, we're a SaaS company. We sell a SaaS product. So it's like everything, everything comes from the narrative, including everything I do in marketing. So leadership buy-in is number one key to making sure that you're building a narrative that will work. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Like you might be a one-person marketing team, but hopefully you're not a one-person company, <laughs> right? Like there's other people in your company that have been interacting with customers for a long time. Uh, so bring them in and, you know, well, I'll just give you my, I think my takeaway um, for later, but this is the go to market narrative is a tool for your whole company. It doesn't live in the marketing silo. Mm -hmm. And like, so bring in, you know, company leadership, bring in the sales team, bring in, you know, field engineering or product engineering, bring in customer service and have all of those insights kind of feel into this. Make sure you talk to customers though, like get actual direct insights from customers, bring those in, but then develop that story as a company together. Um, you know, like we don't like when we do this for clients, we don't just, sit in a room and do this. Like we go through a very detailed process of we interview customers. We share those call report insights with the customer or with the client. Uh, then we do positioning and we share like where we're thinking about with positioning with the client. And then um, we make sure all of that thing is we're all aligned on those points. Then we go and write the narrative and then the client gets to see the narrative one or two times. And, you know, we work together to get it to a place where we think it's a, it's a good product. Um, so yeah, it's not just uh yeah, right and, and done. Like it's it's getting feedback and eyes out from a lot of people. And it's not just, you know, Grace, you know, sitting with a pipe in her mouth and, and writing ball by herself. Is that how you write um go to market narratives, Grace? The pipe That's exactly how I write. Yep. <laughs> exactly how it is. Roommate That's just how I picture all novelist writing. <laughs> Next to a fireplace, big old fluffy dog. Sounds like the dream. So uh, one thing I, I want to kind of take a step back and I had asked Julie um, to come on and kind of talk about this. Um, you know, she made a comment about there being uh, a little bit of a, a step or like maybe a hiccup that happens between getting customer feedback and actually putting it into the narrative. Um, because as soon as customer feedback, if there's maybe a problem, you feel like, oh, we need to solve that problem. We don't want anyone to know about that problem um, sort of thing. And like, I guess I wanted you just to kind of uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're experiencing there, Julie, and um, we can just talk about it. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I have a new microphone. I didn't know if it worked or not. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I sort of transitioned into a marketing position in our company about a year and a half ago. And at that time, um, the the request of me was, you know, we want to get more companies that we're doing business with. Our pool is too small. Let's get more companies in. And so I looked at all of the customer feedback that we had um, from spanning back for a couple of years. And when we sat down and looked over that information, what I brought back to our leadership was, not to throw anybody under the bus here, but um, was we can't handle any more customers. 
Um, our customers right now are saying that we're too busy for them. Our customers are saying that our lead times are too long. Our customers are saying that too much of the process is tied up in one person, and that's not sustainable. And so we've spent the last year, roughly, um, really I, um, addressing that. And um, I conducted interviews with every employee of the, in the company asking them where they see bottlenecks in their process and what are we doing that they think is inefficient and how can we improve that and I you know kind of brought all of that information together distilled it down to some recommendations got some systems in place we didn't even have a CRM so we've got you know now we've got our CRM in place we've got ClickUp in place we have systems and processes that we're still working out but we are leaps and bounds ahead of where we were a year ago. And now our customer feedback that we just reviewed in the last few days was glowing. And I think that without making those changes, we would have a very different message to bring to potential customers right now. Well, it's like the, the, the like we were saying, the go-to-market narrative um, is more than just a marketing tool, just like your customer um, interviews are more than just a marketing tool. Like, yes, they're giving you insights that you can use to help tell the story of how your product or your service has impacted their life positively and gotten them to a better into a better situation. But also, like, when you're interviewing customers and you're asking for honest feedback, you know, we should be grateful when they give us honest feedback, even if it's not always super positive, right? Um, so, I think it's really great that you, as a company, were able to kind of, and I think this is like just the advantage of being in in-house um, that, you know, as the agency, we don't necessarily have, like, but you were able to say, all right, I got this feedback. Truly, what are my priorities? Um, and where do I need to focus the next, you know, six to 12 months to improve the situation and the way that customers are experiencing the company? Um, because uh, just like we, labor is a hot button issue in the manufacturing space, it's like, Customer retention <laughs> is so important, especially as a lot of manufacturing companies are, and like um, are, are modernizing into like, you know, subscription based models in different ways or ways that like kind of taking some of what's happening in the, in the SaaS world. Um, and if you are expecting like recurring revenue or repeat customers or like a larger lifetime value of that customer, but you're not um, giving them the best experience and like encouraging them to maybe come back, then, um, you're undermining yourself. Right. Um, so I think it's just really cool that you took that feedback zoomed out, had the simmer time and said, all right, now what do I do with this information? Um, and how do I, how do I move forward from here to get into a better situation so that I can really tell the story I'm, I want to tell. So much there. Awesome. Um, I think we had, um, always looking at my notes here, we had another question from uh, Zach too about like, you know, really pivoting from the company, uh, pivoting your company from product sales focus. I'll, I'll just Zach, how about you just come on and ask a question? Zach, how about you just come on and say, <laughs> oh, sorry. Hey, yeah. Hey, I... hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it's kind of backtracking because like as much as like kind of I'm on board with everything we're all talking about, um, this sales rep firm that I'm working for is um it's it's a struggle, right? It's it's the it's getting the buy-in because they're very old school. On the one hand, they they hired me to implement a marketing program where there was none before. Um, and they hired me to be sort of that outsider and that creative brain and and to have sort of that novel perspective. But on the other hand, they're also really resistant to it. And um, when I suggest you know anything about branding or anything about a um, content marketing, you know, like I, I talked about pillar pages the other day and like they shut that down so fast. Are they giving you any, Zach, are they giving you any reasons why? Um, well, I don't want, I mean, I really, I, I don't want to um, speak ill of my, sure. <laughs> my employer. Um, but it's, um, you know, so I think the reasons largely have to do with just a, um, you know, they're, they're coming from an, an old school um, yeah. sales background. 
It's yeah. just that that they've been all sales all the time, and sales is what they do. They've not been supported really by marketing. They have a website that sort of is has been redesigned to just barely serve as sort of like a proof of life kind of thing. And um, you know, so here I am coming along trying to like, okay, first a, a logo refresh and brand refresh, yeah. then implementing some new collateral. Now I'm working on email campaigns is sort of the next phase. And I'm starting looking ahead to July where I'm going to be doing some branding exercises with the team. Yeah, And that's where uh, I'm a little nervous about yeah. what we're going to uncover because I think I'm going to hit some resistance because while they'll happily do the exercises, when it comes to implementing the outcomes of those exercises, uh, I'm going to get a lot of resistance. Yeah, I And so I have to kind of step gingerly. So I just want to see what people, if people have had any kind of similar experiences, because it's a very delicate, you know, uh, d- diplomatic walk of mm-hmm. getting that buy-in um, to start to implement some of this stuff. And, you know, as diplomatic as I like to fancy myself sometimes, uh, I, you know, I'm one person and I get frustrated like anyone else. And, and so I, I just want to see what people have done and, and getting that, some of that buy-in and, and implementing these things kind of like in baby steps so that yeah. the frog doesn't know what's being boiled kind of. Yeah. So I'll just say from my experience in, in-house, I brute forced a lot of this and I just did it. <laughs> um, this, so it's not diplomatic. I don't know how effective it'd be for you. Uh, it did kind of work for me. Uh, you know, like we did the foundational work and then that allowed me to have like a place to like build brochures and campaigns from. So, you know, maybe it's just something like, you know, like you said, Zach, maybe it's like starting small with a go to like, and you're, you're like saying a brand, like, so just maybe walk through this narrative with them and then show them like how they can take what you're building here and build that into their sales decks or into their sales emails. Right. Uh, and like, show them like, I can give you that, you know, and I can give you the work so that it makes your work a easier because you have the language and now all the sales reps are speaking the same thing, right? Like, so I, like I said earlier, like, I don't think this is just for you to, you know, do your marketing collateral with, like, this could be something that can fuel and make the lives of the sales reps easier, right? So instead of them, like, oh, I have to make, come up with all these sales emails and, you know, whatever the sales decks or whatever they do, like, maybe you can help them create some of that stuff by starting with a foundational piece like this. Um, and then, you know, and then really lean in, like, Hey, I want to do this branding exercise. I really need your expertise, right? You spend a lot of time with the customers. I need you in here to help me craft what you think this, you know, narrative for our company is. Um, and I can't do it myself because I don't have the expertise that you have, right? So I really like talk them up, make them feel good, get them in a room, make, you know, make the agenda really easy. It just gets something on the paper and then show them how you can help them create the sales tools that they'll use with this narrative. I think that's probably like the the best way I can see in my mind, unless there's other ideas out there. I agree with you, Brendan. I mean, I think just getting almost like uh, kind of tapping into the ego of it all and just uh, letting them know like you really want their input and that you can't do this without them. And like, yeah, you could strong arm it, but it'd be so much better if everyone was part of the conversation and contributed to it. Um, and then, you know, they have some sort of pride in what you guys have created together and maybe they're more likely to use it because really at the end of the day, the reason why we want to have this go to market narrative as our North star is that so everybody is moving in the same direction yes. and that no matter where they're engaging with your company, they're getting the same message every time. And it's all coming back to this holistic journey. Um, you know, if someone is going to, um, what you're hap- what, what's happening is, you know, you're, you're helping this potential buyer move down the story of a plot and therefore move down the funnel and, you know, help them advance in their buyer's journey. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I, I know we're, we're rounding out here. Um, it's, uh, 10 45 central time. Um, Claire mentioned that she'd like to see someone else's go-to-market narratives. Um, We do have a Slack channel um, and I would be more than glad to um, share some information there. If you are not part of the Industrial Marketing Live Slack channel and you want to like keep this conversation going, um, that's what it's there for. So um, we'd love to have you guys join. Just let us know in the chat here or DM 
any gorilla and we'll get you added. Um, but to kind of round out the conversation today, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to just get Grace, Aaron, um, you know, Brendan, like your final thoughts on um, the conversation. What's one takeaway that you want folks to leave this Zoom room with today? I can kick us off with that. So as long as you are basing it, in fact, there is no wrong way to do this. You can include dialogue, you can include paraphrases, you can do bullets, you can do paragraphs. When you're actually physically writing it, as long as there is something on the page, there is not a wrong way to approach this. It's better than nothing. Just get it started. Yeah. Um, Aaron, you have some thoughts? You've been listening this whole time. Uh, I've been so quiet this whole time. I feel like Brendan and Grace and you too, you just like, you had it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> we talked about this on the podcast um, a little bit, the manufacturing marketer. And I think the biggest thing I would say is make sure that this is rooted in reality. You can't just make up a story. You can't just exaggerate the stakes. Make sure it's rooted in your customer interviews and it resonates because of that. Yeah. And then mine, I already said it, but you know, this is a tool for the whole company. It's not a marketing thing. Let your foundational marketing work break out of the marketing silo and get into the C-suite, get into engineering, into sales, into customer service, uh, even, even with your, maybe your field techs and like, and, or even like just, you know, people that are on your floor, like have them understand what your company brand is. I, I think it helps to start building some of that culture. Um, you know, like what we talked about with John Franco on last IML, like having people understand what the vision of the company is, where they stand, what the brand is. I think all that stuff really helps people like just feel rooted in, in a company that they're working for. So yeah, let get, so for like, don't build it in the, in the marketing silo, build it with other team members and then make sure it gets distributed to the rest of the company. And then if you have any partners, like I know a lot of you have distributors that you work with. Uh, this one might be a, a good, I, I don't know, Jared, would, would this be something that'd be useful for you from a manufacturer if you understood what their brand was? Tell me. Yes, it wrong. would. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, it would. And that's something I struggle with as a distributor is trying to come up with my own messaging when I'm also pushing other people's messaging. Yeah, so like it, make your distributor's job easier so they want to sell your stuff and make you more money. So share, share the brand with them, you know, share it with your event, like share it with people. Like it's, it doesn't have to be the secret little, little thing that you hold on to. No, share this thing out with people and use it to frame everything else that you're doing with content and campaign. So, yeah, my, my biggest takeaway today is that once you have this, read it often, like revisit it. Um, every, before I create a, a campaign plan, I think, all right, what story am I trying to tell? What types of ads do I need to tell that story? What content do I need to create? Or what content can I leverage to tell this story? It helps you identify those gaps. So that way, whenever you're distributing something, um, you know, putting paid spend behind something to distribute a message, you're on point with that arc. So read it and then um, use it as a brainstorming tool as you move forward in all of your, your content. All right. Well, with that, thank you so much, Grace. Um, really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with us today. So fun. thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Was I've never been a guest here before. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I know. We, we're trying really hard to, to open up um, Gorilla to everyone. We have so many smart people and um, a lot of them work behind the scenes. And so it's just, um, it's cool to be able to pull in um, folks like give you guys some, some access to her brain. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to join us in Slack, we would love to have you there. I know I've already seen some um, folks asking for invitations. We'll get those out to you guys today. Um, and then uh, the manufacturing marketer, Brendan, what's yeah, coming up? So Aaron, uh, Aaron already did a little plug. Uh, me and Aaron just recorded an episode on all the foundational marketing work. So it's kind of a quick primer on customer interviews, positioning, go-to-market narrative and content plans, like the, the steps that Gorilla goes through for clients to get things up and running for content and campaigns. So that should be coming out like Friday or maybe Monday, uh, depending on uh, when I get that thing edited. So be on the lookout for that in your podcast feed. All right. And then our next Industrial Marketing Live, we're super excited. It's going to be uh, after the holiday week. So July 13th. And we're bringing one of our very favorite industrial marketers back. It's going to be um, true of all of our Star Wars themes today, the return of Mary Keo to the stage. Better than that one. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Mary's going to come on. She's been in a head of marketing role now for a solid uh, 90 days a quarter, right, Mary? Yeah. So we'll have you come on and we'll talk about, you know, what that's been like, and especially, you know, stepping into a company kind of like what Zach was talking about, who has never really had anyone um, leading up that effort before. So how she's made it work and where we're going from here. So hmm. really excited about it. And uh, we will see you then or we'll see you in Slack. So thanks so much for coming, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. This was a lot of fun today. Grace, this was so, so much fun. So much fun. Thank you, Grace. Bye.